Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, anywhere you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Barbara Mwanje. I'm the Africa Chapter Coordinator at the Global Alliance for NGOs for Road Safety. Um, today we're here to discuss the COVID uh, response, COVID-19 response, impact to um, transport and mobility in Africa. Um, you're most welcome. And uh, I'll be sharing uh, the agenda to follow. Thank you. So we've got our speakers today and you're all most welcome. Uh, we've got Mr. Bill uh, M. Halkias, President of the International Road Federation. We've got um, Ms. Lotte Brondam, Executive Director, Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. We've got Ms. Julia Funk, uh, Senior Program Manager and Head of Statistics at the International Road Federation. Ms. Devine Mbamome Nkendong, the Director of Road Transport, Ministry of Transport, Cameroon. Ms. Mabel Tomusange, Program Officer at Hovita, Uganda. And Mr. Patrick Kenyanjui, Program Manager, the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. And uh, Patrick is based in Kenya. Um, you're all most welcome and thank you to the speakers for uh, joining us today. So we will begin today with welcoming remarks uh, and then we'll follow that with uh, introduction of the project and the approach, the methodology. Um, and uh, next we will have testimonies, uh, a country perspective uh, from Cameroon and from Uganda. And uh, these will be presented by both public sector and the civil society uh, organizations. Uh, we will then move on to uh, the preliminary findings. Uh, this has been a study, as I said already, uh, to understand uh, the impact of COVID-19 responses with regards to uh, transport and mobility in Africa. So we will hear preliminary findings um, of the study, um, and these are preliminary, so there will be a final report, and then we will have a question and answer session before we have our closing remarks. Uh, we intend for this to be a very participatory uh, webinar meeting, and uh, we will have uh, all through the different um, presentations that will be made, uh, we would like very much that you participate and you uh, share your questions or thoughts or reflections using the chat, um, the chat uh, in this uh, webinar. And we will be able to respond to your questions as, uh, as the webinar proceeds. Um, I think that's uh, all for now as far as the agenda goes. And I'd like us to go quickly into um, hearing from our various speakers. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Bill M. Halkias, the President of the International Road Federation, uh, to give us some welcome remarks. Uh, most welcome, Bill. Thank you, Barbara. And a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the International Road Federation and on behalf of me personally, who I'm standing in Athens, Greece, weather is wonderful, sunny outside, and the spring is coming. And I do hope that you face the same weather, good weather everywhere you are. In particular, I wanted to be present in this webinar today to stress out how much we at IRF value partnerships and collaborations and how much we value Africa and our African partners in our mission and in our work. Let me start by expressing our gratitude to the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety and a team member of our federation, but also a reliable and precious partner for many of the activities we deploy in Africa. Joining our respective networks and expertise has meant over the past years bringing greater value and greater impact in what we do, especially when it comes into lower and middle-income countries. The NGOs are precious ears and eyes on the ground and help us to keep us focused on the essential, to keep realistic, and to help us to be more just. It was a natural fit to join our forces 
for this much needed piece of work that a grant for HVT program has made possible. And we thank HVT and UK aid for that. In line with its missions to promote the development of roads and road networks that enable access and sustainability for all, IRF has been very active in Africa over the past seven decades, that's 70 years. Some years ago, we decided to further strengthen our action and presence in the continent by establishing the IRF Africa. The objective being to customize, localize and coordinate programs being implemented in Africa and to facilitate and further strengthen collaboration with Africa partners with whom those programs are implemented. The Board of IRF Africa is composed of members from prominent African institutions, multilateral development banks, key regional and sub-regional institutions and stakeholders. I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for their invaluable support. Recovery from COVID-19 and the massive investments that it will entail provide a clear opportunity for a change. We need to seize this opportunity and to structure stimulus for long-term transformative outcomes. We can only do so by working truly in partnership, public and private, industry and civil society. And we need to create the conditions to do so. On this note, I'm happy to report that the International Road Federation is supporting the Total Foundation in building private sector road safety coalitions in several countries around the world. Early this month, the Tanzania Road Safety Coalition has been launched in the presence of the Tanzania Minister of Works and Transport by six private sector companies operating in the country. Equally, early this month, we kicked off as well as the 10-step plan for safe road infrastructure in Tanzania, which is bringing around the table an exceptional mix of national and international stakeholders and all expertise to ensure we design and build roads that are safe for all road users and not just those sitting in a car. Last but not least, I would like to inform on another effort that will support Africa and overall low and middle income countries and beyond. On the 4th of March, we have launched a new knowledge repository on COVID-19 and transport being now hosted on the Global Transport Knowledge Partnership Portal. It is the portal gtkp.com. And for those who cannot remember that, if you go to our website in Geneva, you will find the link to gtkp.com. Thanks to support from the UK aid funded HVT program and working again in partnership with many, and in particular with Zlocat, we have been able to collect, summarize, and organize a wealth of knowledge to facilitate access to those resources and to help shape adequate responses to the current challenges, and most of it, to help shape a sustainable and fair recovery. I have said this, and I will keep repeating this message at every possible occasion until you tell me, Bill, we have heard this so many times. Please, we learn it. Stop telling it. Innovation ought not to be a complicated affair. Innovation can be as simple as making that first fundamental step of reaching out to others and start working together. With this, I would like to close and wish you all a good webinar and look forward to engage with all of you as we walk the journey of recovery. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Halkes, for that very um, engaging and very passionate uh, opening remarks. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Lotte Brondam, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance of Road Safety NGOs. So, um, Lotte, you're most welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you, Bill, for, for, for your very enthusiastic uh, opening remarks. Um, we are Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety, and we are a network of NGOs working in uh, 92 countries around the world. And 73 of these NGOs are based in Africa. We have NGOs in, in 29 countries in, in Africa. 
And a year ago, when the pandemic uh, came, came around, it impacted the NGOs to a very large extent. And we had a lot of voices. We had a lot of feedback from our members around the transport and mobility and how that was uh, affected uh, by them. And uh, six, uh, six months ago uh, came this opportunity to work with the high volume transport uh, program uh, and the funding from the UKA, from the UK government to look at responses and practices uh, in countries in Africa. And we chose seven countries. Uh, and over the past seven, uh, six months, we have been looking at, um, at country responses to the pandemic uh, and also what countries we did. Um, we, we have done this in partnership, as Bill mentioned, with the RAF, uh, and it's really a very, very strong uh, combination we had here with RAF is working with the government and we are working with the NGOs. We have our Africa chapter and we are very, um, we're able to very responsively sort of reach out to the NGOs and get that side. So we looked at the responses and we looked at the, at the uh, practices on the ground, looked at the responses that the countries had done to the pandemic what they have done, not really with an aim to compare countries and what who did best, but really to see what happened in different realities in Africa and pull out key learnings from that. Uh, and this webinar is really intended to uh, give feedback to this is the preliminary findings. So we're not, this is not the final uh, findings. And we would really invite feedback from the audience uh, in this call or in this webinar to make sure that uh, when we're ready for the final report that we have sort of taken your feedback into account. So I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much to the UK government for the support here. Thank you very much to the RAF and thank you to uh, the attendees here at the, uh, at the call for your interest in this very interesting field. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Lotte. Um, so uh, Lotte and Bill have set the tone um, very well, and we all have a good understanding where this began. And uh, I'd like to now welcome Ms. Julia Funk, uh, Senior Program Manager and Head of Statistics at IRF, and she will be introducing the project, telling us a bit more about the approach and the methodology. Thank you so much, Julia. You're most welcome. Thank you. And good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on wherever you are. As Barbara already mentioned, I will be introducing the project and the approach um, that we took with it. So very briefly, first of all, the title of the research project in full is Africa's response to COVID-19 and its impact on transport and mobility of people and goods, a review of policy and practice in seven African countries. And on the map below, we have highlighted those seven countries. So they're very geographically and linguistically diverse. And this was really done on purpose as well to capture as much as possible of what the response has been. So in East Africa, we have Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. In Southern Africa, we have Mozambique. In West Africa, Cameroon and Senegal. And in North Africa, Morocco. And overall, this was a six month project. So we started in the end, at the end of October, 2020, and we were finishing at the end of April, 2021. And as Lotte already mentioned, uh, this is a project funded by UK aid and more specifically by the high volume transport program. And it's being carried out by the Global Alliance and by the International Road Federation. In terms of the ambition and aims of the project, it is really to provide an analysis of the COVID-19 response on the African continent and its impact on transport and mobility of people and goods so that we can facilitate the uptake of good practices that enhance sustainable transport while protecting health and safety. So although we assess seven countries, it's really not intended as a kind of comparison among the countries. It's really just to understand what has been happening on the ground and to be able to come up with recommendations and best practices, and then to provide evidence-based suggestions that policymakers in Africa should consider when defining responses to potential future waves of COVID-19 or other pandemics, as well as for the recovery measures. In terms of the research questions that we addressed, we bucketed these into three different types. So firstly, around the government response. So we really aim to look at what are the current government responses to COVID-19 and what is the impact of those on transport and mobility of people and goods. Secondly, from the institutional and community practice side, what are the institutional and community strengths and challenges in the implementation of the COVID-19 measures? 
And last but not least, uh, in terms of the uptake of emerging best practices, what good practices are emerging that can enhance sustainable transport while protecting health and safety and provide evidence-based guidance? In terms of the impact and use that we envision for this research, firstly, in terms of the target audience, we really aim this broadly. So both national and urban authorities with different levels of institutional capacity, as well as civil society groups, very importantly, that work at the grassroots communities on sustainable mobility planning. And in terms of the change that we envision is to really drive an increased use of evidence-based knowledge by policymakers in Africa, using both a top-down and a bottom-up approach when defining responses to potential future waves of COVID-19 and recovery measures, which encourage public transport, active mobility, and equitable access. And of course, the ideal use of this research is to really contextualize and adopt the responses that are proving successful or promising in other countries and geographies. So very importantly, coming to the approach and how we conducted this research and the methodology that we applied, we looked at those both from two different types of angles. So both IRF and the Global Alliance leveraged their respective networks. Um, so the IRF focused more on the government response and institutional capacity side. Uh, so we started off by conducting a desk review uh, to find out all the data that is already readily available online um, and in the public domain. And then what really helped us a lot was conducting key informant interviews uh, to strengthen the research that we conducted uh, through the available documents. And it was really the key informant interviews that provided the meat uh, for the research and provided the insights of what exactly happened, uh, how was the response coordinated at the government and ministry level, uh, and how was it implemented? And then the Global Alliance looked more on the grassroots community level and we used focus group discussions for this so that we set up in all of the seven respective countries uh, to really gather some insights and observations on what has been happening and what seems to be working and what might be some of the challenges. So overall, the type of evidence that we really aim to gather through this methodology and approach is to provide a first analysis of the African situation and the peculiarities regarding the COVID-19 response and the recovery as an extrapolation from the analysis of these seven countries. So that was the project uh, in a very brief nutshell, and we'll hear some more exciting insights and preliminary findings later on. Thank you, and back to you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, before, I'd like to just very quickly mention or just reiterate that we'd like to have any questions that you might have, please use the Q&A function, you'll find it on your screen. I'd like to invite, before we move on to the Director of Road Transport at the Ministry of Transport Cameroon, I'd like to invite Mr. Bernard Obika, uh, Bernard is uh, the team leader for the High Volume Transport Program uh, with IMC Worldwide. And uh, Bernard, please, you're, you're welcome to give um, your opening remarks for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, my apologies for sort of somewhat late arrival, but it's great to be here. Really good to join you today, the Global Alliance of uh, Road Safety NGOs and IRF. Um, you've been told a little bit about the high volume uh, applied research program, which is funded by the FCDO. Uh, I'm very delighted to be attending this. This is one of 21 um, short term research programs that HVT is funding that's looking at various aspects of the COVID uh, response and recovery strategy. And uh, really, without saying much, uh, this is one of the programs that is making great progress. And I'd like to tell you that our intention is to uh, collate all of this um, in terms of what's coming out from the other 20 programs into some sort of a, uh, a lesson learning documentation, a, a short booklet that will inform both policy and, uh, and, and implementation as well as uptake, which is so, so key to, 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 what, to what happens. The HVT program, uh, it's working in several fronts. Uh, the ultimate aim is to provide evidence that informs better transport for the global south. 
we're finding more and more that the global south is grossly underrepresented in its voice. As we move forward into COP26, we're finding that a con this concentration of the global North's issues without really adequately addressing what the implications of the, what global North does uh, for, for uh, in terms of its policies on climate change for the global South. So we're delighted to be supporting this, uh, which is geared towards COVID-19, but has wider implications as you will see in some of the other projects. So thank you very much. And I look forward to listening to the rest of the preliminary findings from, from this particular uh, project. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Bernard. Um, and so uh, at this point, uh, very privileged to invite uh, Mr. Divine Bamome Ndekong, the Director of Road Transport at the Ministry of Transport in Cameroon. Um, you're most welcome, Divine, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Divine, I'd like to just uh, maybe kick it off with uh, asking you a couple of questions. Um, and uh, just to start to get your your insight, your you know your experience uh, with regards uh, the subject matter COVID nineteen and its impact uh, on mobility, transport and mobility. So, um, in in just a few uh, words, could you maybe share with us how the pandemic um, has impacted mobility and transport? in your country, uh, maybe if you have a couple of statistics with you, that would be most, uh, we'd appreciate that. But uh, if you could give us that and then follow that up with uh, the issue of coordination um, in terms of the response and how that was implemented across different government um, ministries, department agencies, and, and what was helpful particularly in that uh, um, coordination uh, role. So uh, over to you. Divine, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to share Cameroon's uh, 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 testimony. As of uh, this moment, uh, Cameroon has registered uh, uh, 721 deaths to the COVID, uh, which we really great that. Um, um, as far as the impact is concerned, uh, I would like to uh, share, we need the framework of uh, uh, rail transport, uh, civil aviation, maritime, maritime and road transport. Uh, because I uh, I was in the, the coordination team of uh, the, or the, the strategies that we put in place that. So within the, one of the sectors that, that was not really uh, 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 significantly affected, that's not significantly affected by uh, by, the, by the COVID uh, is the rail, the rail transport. The rail transport uh, in Cameroon has two, two, two uh, facets. You have the, the merchandise uh, sector, uh, which uh, whose activities continued uh, normally without any without any uh, interference. But uh, the the passenger the person's uh, passenger side of the transportation was uh, was affected, but not so not so significantly because uh, giving some figures, uh, 2019 before we had the the, the pandemic uh, uh, the COVID. Uh, the first semester, the number of persons that were transported uh, uh, 2019 for the first semester, we had uh, 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 1, 000, uh, 140, 145,831 persons that were transported for first semester 2019. Now, uh, through the, the rail transport, that same period, uh, 2019, 2020, we had uh, 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 151 transported. So I'm going to send these statistics to you uh, after my presentation. So it's clear that at that level, uh, nothing actually changed. But now, if I get to the figures of 2019, we had uh, uh, 154,000 persons that were transported. Uh, this is the, the period when we started uh, implementing the, the COVID measures of the second semester uh, uh, 2020. We had 103,000 persons, so uh, the, the drop wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't significant. But the difference here, the difference here is that uh, with the with the rail transport, um, each uh, 
uh, of the vehicles that's using the rail transport, transport at least uh, transport 80 persons. So the government decided that for each of those vehicles, we should reduce the number of persons transported or short distances to 40 persons. So the capacity was reduced by half. So it simply increased the number of uh, vehicles that were, that were, that were injected in the, in the rail transport fleet. And uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the figures, uh, um, the, the, you compare the figures of the third, the third semester, 2019, we had about uh, 188,000 persons that were transported to the, to the strategy. 2020, the same period, we had uh, 157,000 persons that were transported. So the, the, the difference was not so, uh, wasn't so significant, but, but it was, uh, the impact was felt more in the number of vehicles that were used or by the rail, tra rail transport, because uh, for each, each journey, two of the wagons have to be left empty. In case of uh, in case of uh, a, 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 a case was found, they have to be isolated in those in those two empty empty uh, empty wagons. Now, one thing that's also important with the rail the rail transport sector is the fact that uh, um, they were like some kind of uh, 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 luckily prepared <laughs> because uh, the rail transport system had already put in place a mechanism to manage the the Ebola virus. When the Ebola virus outbreak was in Africa. There was already a mechanism to manage the Ebola virus in the rail transport system. So when the yeah. COVID came, that mechanism was just automatically uh, uh, reactivated, and uh, the medical facilities of the of the of the rail transport system was put into contribution. So the the, the rail transport company has uh, medical facilities which was automatically uh, uh, donated uh, to contain COVID COVID cases. That's like a, 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 a maritime. That's the rail transport sector. Talking about Thank the maritime, you. the maritime sector. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, am I good? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Go on. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move to more other questions, but if you could just briefly uh, finish on the maritime. Okay. Thank um, you. Uh, um, the, mar the maritime sector. Um, we just did a, 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 a quick um, comparison analysis uh, between Cameroon and Nigeria, uh, maritime movement of persons. Uh, Averagely per week, we have uh, 180 persons that uh, displace themselves but to maritime, but with the COVID, it was completely shut down. So uh, uh, it was completely, uh, during the period of COVID, we completely shut down the movement mm -hmm. of, uh, of persons in the maritime, maritime uh, sector. Now with the, the activities steaming up, we have about 60% of that uh, movement of persons uh, and the movement of goods to maritime sector have resources uh, in terms of a movement of goods. The, uh, the Cameroon airspace is not completely open. Now, see we have, we have about 11, 11 uh, uh, civil aviation uh, uh, commercial companies that fly our airspace and they receive special authorizations every month. So there are about 11 of them that receive uh, authorization like like uh, like uh, every month to fly. And we have about a uh, 60% um, drop in the movement of persons. And all the companies in uh, the state companies, the civil aviation authorities are having some financial difficulties and actually asking mm -hmm. for state uh, for the state for state subvention. For the road transport okay. sector, actually uh, goods, merchandise were not were not were not suspended. Movements continued, mm -hmm. but uh, we had to reduce every vehicle capacity. To half of the half of the uh, uh, of of the number that every vehicle is uh, obliged to to uh, to transport. So that's uh, a, a kind of uh, impact in terms of mobility. Mm -hmm. Now you asked the question Divine. about the coordination. Uh, yeah, uh, can I go to that? <laughs> yes. Are you getting me? Well, there was a, a, a small now? problem with the connection. It's better now. Uh, different. I'm we have two I'm minutes. I'm We've getting you. Minutes. Can you get me? Yeah, I can hear you now. But, uh, we have two minutes for you to complete. Can you get me? Yes, I can, can you hear me you now. now? The connection is yes, not very level good. Yes, Cameroon, okay? Can you get me now? Yes. 
Oh, yeah, um, is, it, uh, is, is it better now? It's better now. We, we, we have two minutes, Divine. Hello. Divine, maybe stop you, maybe stop the video yes, and just go. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, two minutes. Uh, uh, hello? Yes, could you maybe uh, stop hello? the video? Stop the video and we'll just proceed with uh, the audio. Maybe that will make it better. Yeah. Yes, uh, is it better now? Yes, it's better. Um, we've got only one minute or two with you, and uh, I'd like us to discuss just very uh, quickly. I have to the video. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's much better now. It's much better. Um, what what were the coordination? What did that look like? The coordination across government. I think we lost the uh, barber. He was uh, frozen. Yeah, I, I I got a bit frozen. I can you get am I can you get me? Yes, now we can get you. Uh, this is Susanna, actually, from the IFF Divine. I'm sorry, I think the barber is, uh, is um, having some connection uh, troubles. She was uh, just telling you that um, time is, is running up. But the question for you was about um, if you could tell us okay. how you managed to get all the coordination, because it seems like you have pretty good figures and pretty good understanding of what was going on in, in the country. And what is the key lessons learned from this experience uh, from you? And what should we focus on going forward? In one minute, Divan, if you can. Thank you. That uh, on camera had we had a, a good coordination. The, the presidents of the republic uh, supervised and then gave uh, gave uh, based on the WHO uh, orientation, thirteen strategic orientation cutting across all the different ministerial departments. And the prime minister uh, once a week uh, we group all the ministers, and the, the, the an evaluation was done. The website was done, and the and the toll free number was put in place to collect to collect information and. Uh, and the Ministry of Public Health was at the forefront, and every other ministry uh, uh, mobilized uh, resources, personnel, and uh, every other person acted within the domain and gave report to the Central Committee. And there was uh, a 24 hours uh, uh, a team put in place, made up of all the different stakeholders, state and non -state, uh, non -state stakeholders, to coordinate 24 hours and receive information to better manage and evaluate their. The, the, the situation. I think uh, the lesson the lesson we learned is uh, the good thing was the coordination. But the coordination gave us uh, a global view. We have a global view on the uh, on on the world and Cameroon and the evolution and in which sector was lacking. And uh, immediately all the uh, resource uh, energy and uh, is focused on that sector to like uh, we bring, bring it under check. So the coordination that was done in Cameroon. Uh, gave us uh, a, a picture of every sector, the hotel, the, 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 the urban mobility, the transport sector, civil aviation, tourism. We, we, we could see every sector how it's been affected and the response where we where, where, where addressed to sectors where uh, uh, we think that could be, could, be a, could be a weakness. And then uh, um, the state budget was restructured and then more money was put into, the, into sectors that uh, uh, have more impact. On the on, on the fight on the fight on the uh, uh, again against the against the COVID, I think that uh, uh, um, uh, we the, our system of coordination really gave us uh, uh, the strength over the management of uh, of this of uh, of this uh, pandemic. And I think one of the the, the the issues we way forward is to focus on the on the protection of uh, movement of persons uh, or mode of transport because in Cameroon. The, 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 the way we have noticed that uh, is when people move using the different modes of transport uh, uh, because of uh, low income, um, that's where we have the spread of this much. So that's why we are putting a, a particular focus on the, 
uh, and the respect of the measures in the public places. Right now, very strict measures have been put in place on the on the social distancing. Uh, uh, group, people should not group themselves more than 50 under no circumstances should that uh, should that happen. And the management of the of COVID remains victims. The remains of COVID victims is strictly government government affair. The government doesn't hand the resources, doesn't hand the remains to the family. The government police the barrier and, uh, and manage the, the cost of barrier to avoid uh, the remains infecting uh, uh, other, 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 other uh, uh, persons that could be safe. Even in schools, uh, the school program uh, uh, was restructured and, uh, and uh, we had three shifts uh, uh, of schools. Students go to school in the morning, others go in the afternoon, others go in the evening to create yes. more space. Uh, Sorry, I have to cut you other way. And I, I would love to uh, keep going with the conversation because it's not by chance we have selected your case. Cameron has a lot, um, a lot to tell. I'm just gonna, and I forgive me for that, but I'm just gonna stop you here so that we can also hear um, from from civil society. And we have Mabel here from uh, Uganda with something to tell us, and maybe we, hopefully we have a, a little bit of time in the end to come back. And I hope in the meantime, uh, Barbara, the moderator, will be able to join us. So thank you so much, Divine, and please stay with us if you can, so that we are able to, um, to uh, take you on board uh, at the end of the session. Uh, we have the testimony now from uh, Mabel Uganda, and she has pre-recorded it for us. Hello, everyone. How are you? Uh, my name is Mabel Tomsange. I'm here to give a community response on the impact of COVID-19 measures on the public transport and mobility research for Uganda. I'm here to represent uh, two road safety NGOs, that is Ureno and Hovite, and I'll briefly tell you what our testimony was for Uganda. We underwent training for focus group discussion data collection. We were provided with a guide to conduct the focus group discussions. We mobilized communities to collect views and responses from different transport modes and different road users during COVID-19, including walking, cycling, passengers, riders, and drivers. We managed to do four focus group discussions with average of 12 participants per group we also collected various responses from group to group. We shared experiences and we also got views which tended to have a common thing. Let me share some of the experiences we had from the community focus groups. One is that in Uganda, all the communities tried as much as possible to follow the government guidelines or the standard operating procedures for COVID-19 in Uganda. We also developed and had various um, behaviors that were adopted and the ones that were copped by the Ugandan communities. Some of the desired uh, behaviors that we collected from the community. And we also saw the use of bicycles, which is not common in Uganda. And a lot of walking in the cities and the suburbs was seen more than usual. We also noted night riding of motorcycles reduced because of the curfew time and all the restrictions on movement. And in turn, we saw reduced crime because in Uganda we have a lot of crime that has been uh, seen uh, used on motorcycles. This was reduced and there was better planning for drivers as several of the vehicles were reduced off the roads. We also noted uh, some not desired uh, behaviors that probably are not good. Speeding was observed because majority of drivers and riders were trying to beat curfew and therefore 
they were riding excessively fast and thus endangering our Ugandan passengers. And because of the restrictions, the SOPs, there was reduced capacities for several modes of transport, like buses, like taxis. Uh, the capacity was reduced to a half. And as a result, all the fares for public transport doubled, which was a big problem for the passengers because the cost was passed over to the passengers. And there was also corruption that was noted as people were trying to avoid arrests after curfew time, there was corruption that was observed. Some of the views that we collected from the communities that could be useful for us going forward, Uganda needs to professionalize the driving activity in Uganda. And that's a big issue that uh, was seen and observed during COVID-19. We also noted that there are no decent resting and eating places for drivers, particularly drivers along the highways. And riders in Uganda need to have separate lanes. Oftentimes they are squeezed off the roads by other road users or even other vehicles. And we have seen them actually riding on the pavements, which is not good and not desired at all because it infringes on the rights of the, the pedestrians as they are using the same government. So the riders need their own lens. The other observation was that hand washing and sanitizing was really desired and was coped for by many users. It is a good behavior and we have seen many of the communities adopting to it as a good uh, method of COVID-19 prevention. There are few challenges that we also observed, and one of them was that it was very difficult to socialize, uh, to social distance as a pedestrian. That was close to impossible. Also noted that the billion passengers, those that use the motorcycles, the bicycles, it was very difficult to social distance their passengers. And so that was also noted as a challenge. Secondly, some of the passengers decided to use the space that was created to carry goods for their own traveling. So that was a challenge and that was also noted, what was noted in the community. As an NGO, as NGOs in Uganda, we welcome this research, we welcome the research findings because what we noted it was that this exercise, this research, these findings were very important for road safety NGOs in Uganda, particularly during the time of COVID-19 pandemic. We hope to use the findings of this research that will be released soon to advance our advocacy activities in Uganda. Good evidence based uh, to approach some of the challenges that we have in Uganda in road safety, but also to engage decision makers in Uganda. So we are grateful for the research and we want to thank the funders of this research and all the persons that have supported this uh, study uh, going forward. As, as Ugandan NGOs in road safety, we appreciate the findings uh, from these research studies and we believe that road safety in Uganda will be seen at higher levels. Thank you very much for listening to me. And we pray that this research continues and goes further and further to probably discuss uh, a further in-depth understanding of this COVID-19 uh, impact on transport and mobility in Uganda and in the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mabel, um, for sharing. I know you're with us. Um, thank you for that video. And uh, uh, Divine, I, 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 I took a bit of time off, but uh, thank you for your um, submission as well. I'd like to invite uh, Patrick now.
uh, Kenyanjui to uh, share with us the preliminary findings uh, of this uh, study. Uh, Patrick, you're most welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, those who have spoken ahead of me. And uh, without much ado, I want to dive in into the presenting you the preliminary findings of this research. Uh, the way we have uh, planned it for this particular dissemination for this seminar, we have four parts that I'm going to discuss quickly. The first one is on what were the mobility measures and responses. Secondly, with the containment and closing policy. The third will be the case study of Uganda. And finally, we look at the initial findings, how they look like. So on the screen where you have, you have on the screen is a um, figure there with the two axes. So for mobility measures and response on COVID-19, uh, we looked at quickly a snapshot of what happened uh, to the public sector. What was the government doing and the private sector? So this just to show you that on the side of uh, the COVID response and uh, the measures, we had two uh, sort of parts of the axis, the mobility adaptation on one hand, and on the uh, left side, we have the mobility reduction. So definitely we, have, we saw that there was reduction in mobility due to, of course, capacities, uh, car fuse, and all the other and lockdowns and so on. Then there was mobility adaptation, which was about the protecting the public and operators and users from COVID, uh, contracting COVID or transmitting COVID. And the private sector, on the other hand, uh, due to the measures given by the government or student, people tried to do their own the measures. And we have uh, such as transit operators reducing capacity. So the walking and cycling as witnessed by in Uganda and so on. There were some few illegal things happening on the private sector. And again, those were addressed as we continue with our uh, research. Uh, the reduced mobility, again, the private sector were able to do uh, increased delivery services. Some moved from passenger to cargo and so on. So in a snapshot, the mobility measures and, and response, what we focused on more first was to look at this uh, on the other side, mobility reduction and mobility adaptation. Uh, if we move to the next uh, containment and closing policy, this is where uh, the real work starts. In the next slide, please. The next slide, yes. So uh, on the second part of our preliminary findings, we are looking at containment and closing policies. And there we focused on three areas or three major transport uh, uh, domains, as we, we can say that international travel controls, restrictions on public transport, and we also looked at restrictions on internal movement. So what is before you here uh, is our heat maps for the three uh, parts of uh, the three stages of the three uh, domains of travel. International travels, uh, we see on these heat maps, we have a scale and we, all, we notice the colors, dark color, uh, slightly dark color, and then no color at all. What this depicts are the restrictions that were put in place and how strict they were, or whether there were any measures or no measures or measures recommended. So from zero to one, for example, when you go to international travels, where there is zero, there were no measures at all. Where there's one, there were some measures. And if you go to two more strict measures, and this, as you go to four, you have extremely strict measures that totally banned international flights. So this was the situation for each country of the seven countries we assessed. So the heat map for international travel is available for uh, those countries. And you can look at different as the, as the time moved from uh, the, the first announcement of COVID in the countries, what was the trend in terms of the restriction and the strictness of those measures. Uh, risk on the public transport is the same. If you look at the, the heat maps, uh, for example, for Cameroon, you find that uh, almost consistently they started and moved on until to a certain point where, it's, uh, where, there's no, where there's a blank there, you find there's no data. But what we are looking at is from zero to two, zero is where there was uh, actually no measure. Two, there is highest restrictions on mobility in public transport. So again, these heat maps for uh, restrictions on public transport are available for the seven countries. Then we move to restrictions on internal movement. And this is basically, of course, from regions, for example, if a country has provinces, municipals, districts, counties, or cities, intercity movement, interurban, and so on. So in some of these countries, you'll find that we are having 
very strict measures for interurban or intercity movement, while others are a bit not less strict. So again, on the ordinal scale of zero to two, we see from zero, less strict on that lack of data, to more strict and to very strict measures as we uh, as the heat map darkens a lot across the time period that uh, we were looking at this research, the six months uh, from the onset of COVID until the onset of the research. So this gives us again a snapshot of what does it did it look like in terms of uh, taking up continued measures and how are they being implemented uh, or taken up by in the public and how the government was really implementing them. Uh, if we go to the next, the, the next part, which is a case we have picked. As I said, these seven countries is what we are covering, but for the sake of this discussion, uh, we look at one case study of Uganda and see what was the picture like, what is the, was the situation. So I'll quickly uh, go through uh, the four parts and uh, to try and explain so that we see what really was happening here. And if you look on the top left side, you know, top left side I mean, is where we are talking about compound PCR cases. This was, of course, the base, so what you can say, the reference point for all the research. What was the, uh, the trend in terms of daily reported cases? So on the y-axis over time, the first March to 31st of March, uh, that first of December the, on the y-axis in Uganda, you can see a very, very strong increase towards the end of the year. You can see the spikes there where the COVID uh, cases were reported daily, they, they were rising at, towards the end of the year. At the lower left side, what we did was to look at, uh, sort of we have, on one side we have the first wave, a blank then the second wave. So what that uh, reflected and tells us is that, and we were plotting this using the Google mobility data for the same, same time frame as where the COVID uh, cases were being reported. Uh, so we see how the number of visits changed between each day in 2020 compared to the same in the baseline or what we can say, we are looking at 2019 when there was no COVID, that was our sort of baseline. But now 2020, we find a decrease in the, actually in the uh, daily visits, they have they changed uh, tremendously. But overall, we also see clearly that over the whole time series, the visiting frequency went down. So as you can see, the graph going down, that's the, down below, below the baseline, but then it's rising gradually and uh, up to the interface. Then on the second wave, we still find a rise on that. And that's an interesting observation. And then uh, towards the end of the year, as we ended up, uh, we end up the year, we find that it's again a slightly dipping. So it looks like uh, on, on the lower right side, if you look at now, we are looking at from this, uh, what you have the monthly change in visitor frequency to transit stations compared in 2019. So it has gradually, it dipped and then increased. When we look at the other uh, graph there, uh, this, the graph on the lower uh, right hand side, we are showing uh, what was the sort of visit frequency in different locations or in different uh, uh, parts uh, of, of the city or on the country. So we have, for example, visit to pharmacies, visit to grocery stores, visit to uh, transit stations. And what we see is that in those six different locations for which the uh, Google mobility data was available, uh, on the radio axis from the center to the circle border, if you can see it from the center to the circle border, we plot the average value of the visits in 2020 compared to the base in 2019. And we have done this for two different locations, the first wave or two different periods, the first wave and the second wave. And what's interesting there is to find that in the second, in the first wave, there was, again, it, it, it actually shows or correlates with what we are seeing in the uh, visit, for example, in the uh, transit stations, that there was general reduction in the interface. We have a gradual rate. And then at the Patrick, second phase, we have- Two minutes, please. Sorry, right two, two minutes, Patrick. Two minutes to wrap up for you. Okay, so you. Uh, yes, so that was, uh, so there's generally second wave, we are finding an increase in a uh, number of visits in different, for different locations. And uh, if we look at, uh, so what I would like to say, share, say is that this particular uh, case study is reflected sort of in every country, we have this kind of data for each country in terms of the 
PCR cases, visits, and restrictions given by the government and their severity across time. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I think it should be the last, uh, Barbara. So the initial kind of findings that we are looking at uh, are just the initial kind of findings as we have been reflected from uh, Cameroon and Uganda is that they, are, they seem the data suggests an urgent need for the push towards to inter integrating uh, representatives of informal transportation sector is very key. Uh, for example, we would hear the, the informal sector in Africa is quite expansive in transport and they, are, they are, were not very well involved. So that the second thing is in terms of implementation. Uh, once the government looks at this uh, representation, then in implementation, there is need to harmonize, you know, to harmonize, uh, for example, cross-border. And this is one of the examples of harmonization of transport system. The cross-border was complained from different uh, countries, especially in East Africa, and the cross-border testing, uh, so waiting times, and whether the COVID was valid or not, there was lack of that harmonization. So we need, I think that is coming out clearly. Another finding that is coming out is the improved coordination within transport sector is clearly needed. For example, we have, a, we have had a case of uh, double the pricing cost of tra traveling, yet that should not be happening because at the expense of the, the, the public. So um, deployment of rapid, you know, the rapid deployment of user-friendly uh, environment for cycling, bicycle, sidewalks, and cycling, all this is actually required. This is what is coming out. And this, in a nutshell, is what will be, is, has, is, has been gathered from all these other countries that we, we have been looking into. So um, it's a very quick snapshot. And uh, as I say, of course, the details will be there, but for the interest of time, and I know there could be questions. So we looked at those four. So in summary, I said, what are the mobility measures in the response, containment and, pol and, and closing policy? And then the case study of Uganda, which is also found in all the other countries. And then what is coming out from the initial findings that we'll actually uh, give in details in our next dis dissemination. So with those three remarks, <laughs> thank you very much, Barbara. Over to you. Welcome, Patrick. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have uh, any time left for questions. However, we've noted all the questions and we will um, answer these questions via emails. We have all your contact details. We will get back to you and the various panelists will answer your questions. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Lotte uh, to uh, close uh, the webinar. Welcome, Lotte. Thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you very much to all our participants here on the, on the call, all the speakers. Um, thank you very much for, your, for sharing your insights. I think it was very interesting to hear the the testimonies from the ground and really what um, because what we have done here is we is to uh, collect information and get some key findings and get some responses from the communities but you're the one who are living it uh, in the countries um, a lot of you have questions on on next steps there will be a report that's finished uh, in early may uh, it will go on the HVT website it will go on a rf website and on on the alliance website and you can find links where you can go to the report there um, there will also be a second step. Uh, this is the preliminary, pre preliminary findings. We will have a session with uh, different stakeholders, governments, um, the private sector, the border borders, the informal sector and the private sector uh, who have been involved in this, where we will give much more sort of substantial recommendations coming out of this. And again, this was a snapshot. It's, six, it's seven countries in six months that we have been collecting an, an enormous amount of, of information from. And this was not meant to be an extensive, very in-depth survey. It was to get an, a snapshot. There will be future of, um, pandemics, uh, possibly where where this is diff is very important uh, learnings to to have. So, thank you very much for your time um, and uh, good luck with everything. And I hope you will be interested in getting the final report. You can find it on our website. Thank you very much. <laughs>